Welcome to the RE Podcast, the first dedicated RE podcast for students and teachers. Episode 6, The One Where God is Evil. My name is Louisa Jane Smith and this is the RE Podcast, the podcast for those of you who think RE is boring, which it is, and I'll prove it to you. One of the main reasons why many people do not believe in God is because of all the evil and suffering in the world. This argument is commonly known as the problem of evil and basically argues that if God is omnipotent, just a fancy way of saying all powerful, then he should be able to stop all evil and suffering. And if he is omnibenevolent, a poncy way of saying all loving, then he should want to stop all evil and suffering. And yet evil and suffering exist. So either God is not all powerful he's not all loving, or he doesn't exist. Now, if you want to get really technical, then we would call this an inconsistent triad, where there are three things, like the three points of a triangle, that cannot all logically exist together. Evil and suffering on one point, God's omnipotence on the second point, and God's omnibenevolence on the other. To make it work, we would have to get rid of one of the points, but then clearly you can't have a triangle. But also, which one do you get rid of? Clearly not evil and suffering, as that absolutely exists. So maybe it's God's omnipotence or his omnibenevolence, but then he wouldn't be God. So what's going on? For many people, the only logical conclusion is that God does not exist. Right, let's start by exploring what we mean by evil and suffering. To be honest, this could be a whole episode on its own. Do we look at pain? Well, physical pain is necessary to alert us that something is wrong. So what about emotional pain? Would we know how to empathise with people if we hadn't experienced this? And of course, there are degrees to everything. Stubbing your toe isn't ideal, but is it really suffering? And are we actually arguing for a world where there are no degrees of anything, where we are on a flat level of incidences? If there were no negative experience and only degrees of positive ones, would the lower positive occurrences be considered evil? Would there be able to be competition if there was no suffering? What would happen to the Champions League if no one could lose? And what about death? In a perfect world, would there be no death? Yes, death causes suffering, but it is also necessary to give other people the opportunity to have life. I know, I know, it's all getting a little bit overwhelming. For the purpose of this podcast, let's just talk about two categories of evil, moral evil and natural evil. Now, moral evil is any action done by humans that causes suffering. For example, cheating or killing or bullying. Natural evil is anything within nature which causes suffering, so natural disasters or cancer. There are, of course, I'm sure some of you have worked this out already, which could be in both categories. So cancer, it can have a human cause or a natural cause. What Christians are challenged to do is to give a good reason why God allows evil and suffering when he is meant to be omnipotent and omnibenevolent. This is called a theodicy. Theos meaning God, DK meaning justice. Theodicy is justifying the existence of God in the face of evil and suffering. Now, the most common theodicy, the most common reason why Christians say God allows suffering is because of the free will defence. We associate this theodicy with Augustine of Hippo, spelt exactly the same as the animal. Now, he was a North African philosopher in the first century. The free will defence basically states that God gave humans complete freedom to act as we want. And sometimes we choose actions which create suffering in others. For example, you are in a relationship. Someone else catches your eye. You have complete freedom as to whether you cheat or not. If you choose to cheat, it is very likely to cause suffering. Killing, lying, stealing, bullying. These are all choices that a human has made. I am writing and recording this during the COVID-19 pandemic and best guesses at the moment is that this was caused by a human action, a human working against nature in an animal farm in China. But something we do know is the spread of it is directly caused by human actions or human inactions. The free will argument originates from the story of Adam and Eve in the Bible. So God created a perfect world for humans with one rule, that we don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Of course, we did eat from it, and the consequence was that evil and suffering entered the world for the first time. Whether the first two people were called Adam and Eve, and whether the tree was literal or just a metaphor, I don't know, but there are some very interesting points to consider from this story. First, 
is that Eden is said to be situated between the River Tigris and the River Euphrates. So look on a map, that's modern day Iraq. And it was previously known as Mesopotamia. You might have heard of that. A massively fertile land. Secondly, we can all relate to this story as we grow up and desire knowledge. We are told not to do things, but we do them and there are consequences. So maybe the tree is a symbol of our own desire to learn for ourselves through our own mistakes. What is also interesting is the parallels between the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin and our knowledge of human history. So we know that we used to be hunter-gatherers and we would roam around the earth quite happily in little small groups and eat whatever the land provided. Our diet was therefore seasonal and plentiful and varied. We didn't have to worry about anything or even work that hard, just a couple of hours a day getting the food we needed. As our brains evolved, we developed agriculture and farming techniques so that we could stay still and not have to keep moving around all the time. It is at this point in human history that we see the first evidence of arthritis. Our working days increased so that we could tend to our crops. Ownership came into the human existence for the first time. And with ownership came the need to defend our land. And humans killed each other for the first time in history. This also created hierarchy. Initially between humans and nature, we now moulded and used nature rather than working in harmony with it, but eventually between humans and other humans, as some had more and others had less, and we stopped sharing everything. Also, our increased brains meant increased head size, and this had implications for childbirth. Think about it. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. What punishments did God give Adam and Eve for eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. First, enmity between nature and humans, so conflict, increased pain in childbirth, and through painful toil, you will eat food. We are now going to have to work hard to survive. So maybe there's something to this theory. Humans suffer through our own actions. And most suffering, right at its root, has a human cause. Even most natural evil, for which many people criticise the free will defence as not explaining, when we started working against nature rather than with it, nature fought back. For example, we pollute the atmosphere, it causes global warming, and this increases natural disasters. And actually, natural disasters are not, in themselves, evil. A tornado spinning its way around the world does not cause evil. In fact, they are very mathematically beautiful and right at their heart, very peaceful. It is only when humans stand in their way that they create destruction. Let's take flooding. Flooding has traditionally created fertile land from which to grow an abundance of food. Mesopotamia that I mentioned earlier is situated in something called the Fertile Crescent. And this was only made possible by seasonal flooding of the nearby rivers. Cancers are often caused by human actions, obesity, smoking, alcohol, drugs. But there are some cancers which do seem to have no direct human cause and are just where a cell suddenly decides to metastasize and become cancerous. However, there is research that is beginning to link underlying stress as a cause of cancer. So the question then becomes, why doesn't God intervene? Well, there are two possible answers to this. One is that if God intervened every time someone was about to do something that would cause suffering in others, transform bullets into bubbles or punches into puddles, this would create a very strange world with no natural laws, no consequences and no free choice. The second point is that God does intervene. People claim that God does miracles and heals people. In the Bible, he even raised people from the dead. But I think this is a genuine problem. Why doesn't God heal everyone? Or more than that, why does he allow people to get ill in the first place and then only help a handful of people? So why doesn't God limit suffering? Well, it is possible that he has and we just don't know about it. But let's assume he hasn't. And what if God does that now? So he removes rape and child abuse and Ebola. Then the next level of suffering moves up to top place. So we ask God to remove that layer, murder and torture. Eventually, if we follow this process to its natural end, we will wake up and exclaim, Why, God, why? How can there be a God when my hair looks this bad? An alternative theodicy is by Irenaeus, also from the first century, about a 100 years before Augustine in Greece. Irenaeus essentially argues that suffering makes us better people, that we learn through our suffering and develop good qualities like kindness and patience. Let me give you an example. One of my sons was going to a breakfast club for the first time. 
He was seven at the time and really anxious about going in. He wouldn't let go of me and I had to leave him crying. It was heartbreaking. When I went to pick him up at the end of the day, he was really proud of himself because he'd got through it. This sense of pride in himself for getting through something which made him anxious helped develop and support his self-esteem. It's called soul making. And for Irenaeus, it means that you're becoming more like God. I actually think this is a great idea and I can find endless stories of how adversity has brought out the best in people, apart from the fact that it goes against everything that Christianity stands for. And in that way, it is an unsuccessful theodicy. The Christian story is that God created a perfect world, a world that was very good, but that we sinned and the punishment was death. But Jesus died in our place so that we could be forgiven for our sins and go to heaven. The Bible doesn't say that we are created imperfectly and get better, but that we are created perfect and fell. So while this theodicy may be true in terms of the human experience, it cannot justify the existence of God in my mind. For those of you who listened to the interview with my dad, he explained his answer to this question, which is that God has dealt with evil and suffering. He's prepared a place for us where there is no more pain, there is no more suffering. But he's currently waiting for as many people to become Christians before he ends the world and makes this a reality. The final idea I would like to put to you is that actually there is a problem of good. How can there not be a God when there is so much good in the world? Beautiful sunsets, falling in love, laughing, friendship, chocolate, holidays. But let's consider this. Maybe there is a truly evil God who allows some beauty and happiness only to then take it away. You watch your youthful body age and degrade. You fall in love only to have your heart broken. You watch people you love die. You watch others laugh while you cry. So my conclusion is this. The problem of evil has nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with us. It is our responsibility to solve the problem of evil. How can we do this? In our own lives, every day. Do little things that ease the suffering of others. Recycle, give a kind word, act selflessly. Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. And maybe this is the solution to the problem of evil, that we each have the potential to end suffering in the world. I am Louisa Jane Smith. This has been the RE Podcast, a podcast for people who think RE is boring, which it is. I just proved it. But thank you so much for listening to me bore the life out of you.